Hello, and welcome to another edition of AppSec Decoded. I'm Taylor Armerding, security advocate for the Synopsys Software Integrity Group. And today we're going to be talking about software supply chain problems and solutions. Software development teams know that these days software is more assembled than written from a mix of proprietary, third party, and open source components, communication APIs, protocols, and business logic. But given the pressure on them to build ever faster, in some cases tens of thousands of builds a day, creating an inventory of all the components used in those builds gets ignored, viewed as an intolerable drag on getting things to production on time. But the risks of not having an SBOM, Software Bill of Materials, can do more than slow things down. They can lead to breaches that range from a nuisance to existential threats. So today we're joined by Mike McGuire, Security Solutions Manager with the Synopsys Software Integrity Group. He's been with the company for two years, working on open source risk management, and has seen the same horror stories we've all seen that result from software supply chain attacks. Mike, thanks for being with us. Pleasure. So why have software supply chain attacks like SolarWinds and Log4j or Log4Shell was the vulnerability become so attractive to cyber criminals? Well, I think firstly is the impact area of them was mm -hmm. so extremely widespread yep. and they really hit close to home. It really had a lot of folks in organizations, software development companies starting to realize, mm. wow, this really can affect me. This yeah. really can yeah. hurt me. A lot of times we stand off to the side and read headlines and say, wow, that's terrible, but mm -hmm. it's not me. Right. That really right. changed that quite a bit. Second of all, especially when you look at solar winds, the solar winds attack, mm -hmm. it's really the very essence of a supply chain, a software supply chain attack, mm -hmm. in that the organizations that were affected were several degrees of separation away from the actual attack vector, yep. where that attack took place. So you had threat actors mm -hmm. who took advantage of a simple password that was leaked mm -hmm. to infiltrate build systems and then insert malicious code which would then make its way to the final targets. Yep. In this case, it was U.S. federal government agencies. So that in and of itself, I think, really woke people up as well. And then with the Log4j situation, while that wasn't really a particular hack or incident, mm -hmm. it really served to show how widespread a security vulnerability can become and just the massive impact that can have downstream in the supply chain. What do organizations need to know about the components in their software supply chain? Well, first of all, they need to know the components <laughs> they need in to their know software. The exactly. You, you can't secure what, what you, don't you don't know, know you exists. have. It's exactly. a mantra. Absolutely. Yeah. So you need to have visibility of the software that's running your business. Right. So if you're a software builder, you need to know about the vendor provided or commercial off-the-shelf software or open source software that you're using to build your applications. Mm -hmm. If you're just a consumer, mm -hmm. then you need to know everything about the software components that you are purchasing and then using to run your business. And then of course, what goes into those, what makes those up. Right. It's really not enough to take a good enough approach here right. because security is only as strong as its weakest link. It's going to be that component that you don't identify mm -hmm. that's going to cause you the biggest issues. So again, just to reiterate, you have to know what's in your software. You have to know the components. And then from there, you can identify which versions you're running. Right. And then you can go and map to known vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. You can do things like track licenses. Mm -hmm. You can track the health and viability of those components. And then also you can keep an eye on them in case there are any new vulnerabilities that are disclosed, like right. the log for shell, for example. Right. There's tons of organizations that took mm -hmm. those and built mm -hmm. them into their applications. And it was a completely secure component that day. Mm -hmm. And years later, 
that was shattered. Right. Is there a way to know when, I, I keep hearing, especially with open source, that um, the open source community obviously is kind of voluntary. And so some projects only have one or two or a dozen developers. It's not thousands. And so they sort of fall out of support without sort of announcing that they're falling out of support. Is there a solution to that? Yes. So it's important to, obviously it's important to focus on vulnerabilities, yeah. but issues, security risks do go beyond that. And that is so important in staying proactive in securing your supply chain. Right. And part of the security risks that go beyond that are how well maintained a yes. open source project is. Right. And you can look at several different metrics to determine that. You can look at developer activity, so right. how many developers are working on it, right. how often they are updating it, right. how often that component is updating its, its dependencies, because mm -hmm. it's going to have dependencies. Yep. Um, so those are, there, there's tons of different metrics you can look at in order to determine the health and well-being of, of this open source component. Right. And the way I like to describe this is operational risk. Okay. And what operational risk basically is, is among a few other things like tech debt, is a gateway to security issues. Because put simply, if you don't have developers finding and fixing and, mm -hmm. and looking for bugs, and so if you're, um, then, you, then they won't be finding and fixing security bit, right. um, issues either. Right. However, you might have threat actors going through, mm -hmm. finding these, and they're not known to responsibly disclose of course not. <laughs> they don't want to. Yep. I'm Taylor Armerding. This is AppSec Decoded. Thanks to Mike McGuire, and we will see you the next time.